Pyramids and Mars Often regarded as one of the greatest stories of the classic era, and a typical example of the Philip Hinchcliffe, Robert Holmes-led period of Doctor Who. But what makes it great? If you think it's great at all, then does it still stand the test of time since its original broadcast back in 1975? This is what we're going to look into in this video. But if you haven't yet seen Pyramids and Mars, please be aware that there are spoilers ahead. Without further ado, let's indulge. The story begins with explorer Marcus Scarman uncovering a hidden tomb in Egypt before coming under attack from an unknown force. Meanwhile, the Doctor and Sarah are en route back to Earth in the TARDIS when they are drawn off course by a powerful entity and landing in the correct location, but decades earlier than they intended, in 1911, in a priory that existed before Unit HQ. Before too long, they discover that a now-possessed Marcus Scarman, with the assistance of robotic mummies, are building a rocket to free the imprisoned Osiris Sutek, an all-powerful alien who has the ability to destroy worlds. Tom Baker's take on the Doctor is seen as maybe the most alien of all the Doctor's incarnations, regarding his mannerisms and viewpoints. This was something that Tom Baker consciously wanted to do from when he took on the role, and maybe it's to highlight a stark contrast to John Pertwee's portrayal, which in a way was perhaps more human due to the Third Doctor's exile on Earth. The Fourth Doctor being alien-like in persona, he wouldn't have fitted the Earthbound unit of ventures and constraints long term, and in his opening scene, he is actually reflected on the length of time he has been on Earth by reminding Sarah that it isn't his home, and he should be doing something better than being unit scientific advisor now that his exile has long been lifted. He later laments this to the Time Lord equivalent of being middle age when he tells Sarah he is about 750 years old. His alien nature also transpires later in the story with his lack of empathy towards Lawrence Scarman and that his brother, Marcus, is long dead, and his body is simply an animated puppet controlled by Sutek, and cannot understand Lawrence Scarman's personal emotional conflict when the Doctor is attempting to sever Sutek's control. Despite the Fourth Doctor also being known for his mockery fools who are in denial and random reactive nature, he plays this down for a lot of the story, but generally due to the nature of the narrative. Initially being light-hearted when he and Sarah are discovered by the butler roaming the Priory, and then obtuse with Lawrence Scarman when asking what year they are in, he immediately becomes downbeat and serious as a means of reflecting the serious nature of Sutek and what potential damage he could do. This in turn makes him more short-tempered, in particular towards Lawrence Scarman, more defiant when he realises he must put his own life at risk to confront Sutek, and more concerned when Sarah's life gets put at risk. The final highlighted aspect of the Doctor in Pyramids and Mars is the way he highlights his role as a time traveller when Sarah challenges the implied threat of Sutek being capable of destroying the Earth by highlighting that she is from the future where Sutek must have failed. The Doctor responds by briefly taking Sarah and Lawrence back to her time to show them a desolate Earth and the fact that they are involved means that they have to stop Sutek. To modern viewers who are more accustomed to the newer Doctor Who stories, this can be seen as the opposite of a fixed point in time, which often crops up, or as the Doctor refers to, alternative time. In short, this is one of Tom Baker's best examples of his serious performances under the Philip Hinchcliffe era. As mentioned in many other of my reviews, the role of a companion from an audience perspective is the one to be asking the questions to the Doctor, and therefore acting as their representation. Sarah, like a lot of companions, is a great example of this role within the narrative, but her resourceful and curious nature gives her that extra edge over most of her companions. Throughout Pyramids and Mars, Sarah is mostly by the side of the Doctor, which allows her to interact by asking those pivotal questions, but also as a means to show her resourcefulness. Upon the Doctor name dropping Sutek, or his alternative name as Set, Sarah is able to take over the Doctor's role to the audience by delving into some knowledge of Egyptology, by establishing the link between ancient Egypt and the Osirian race that Sutek originates from. Another strange example of her resourcefulness is her ability to successfully shoot a rifle when she has to shoot a crate of gelignite planted by the Doctor 
to destroy the missile Marcus Garman and the mummy robots have constructed. Despite it not being an expected attribute of a journalist, it further outlines Sarah's importance not only as a companion, but also to the narrative itself. The chemistry between the fourth Doctor and Sarah is one of the best examples of a Doctor-companion relationship in the entire history of Doctor Who, and a lot of this goes down to the working partnership of Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen. There is a clear professional appreciation of each other, and this prevails a lot during season 13, and Pyramids and Mars is a great example of the dialogue counteracting each other in a way that was written in respect to the chemistry. The two characters are witty in their responses in the same manner of a comedy act, with Sarah mocking the Doctor while he bemoans life working with Unit, or commenting on the state of his shoes, or provoking him when he's dressed as a mummy. Additionally, Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen had built up such reputation by now that they were entrusted by the production team to ad-lib to the scenes. This is perhaps best represented in the final episode, where the pair perform a Marx Brothers-like routine when they walk into a room and telepathically turn around and walk straight back out at the same time before one of the robotic mummies sees them. It's moments like this that makes their story even richer in content. Sutek, the primary antagonist of the story, is an Osiren, an alien race with godlike powers who embedded themselves into Egyptian mythology. Being fearful of other races that could rival his power, he set about going on a destructive path which was prevented by his fellow Osirens, who imprisoned him in a tomb on Earth, with Sutek lying in an almost paralysed status from a power source on Mars. Marcus Scarman's breaking into Sutek's tomb allowed Sutek to make him his puppet, and use him and the robotic mummies to make a rocket capable of destroying the power source on Mars, so he can become free once again. The character is a strong example of Doctor Who antagonists, who are aliens with godlike powers, or aliens imitating gods. The only narrative downside to characters with godlike powers is the limitation to display this power on screen. In Sutek's case, for the near enough entirety of the story, he is actually confined to his tomb in a chair, but the glimpses of his power from the ability to control Scarman and temporarily the Doctor highlight to the audience his overall potential abilities. Additionally, with the character being largely stationary, the characterization has to come from his voice, this resulting in actor Gabriel Wolfe being hired for the role, who specialised in vocal delivery, and in turn he provides Sutek with a quiet, mostly calm, precise voice that rarely shouts and doesn't rely on volume to highlight his aggression or threat. Over 30 years later, Gabriel Wolfe would return to Doctor Who, voicing the Beast in the stories The Impossible Planet and The Satan Pit. The more animated and physical intimidation comes from Bernard Archer's portrayal of Marcus Scarman. The character is essentially the physical aspect of Sutek, with him being under his control, and he oversees the construction of the rocket. Sutek also tasks him with the job of removing anyone attempting to sabotage the construction of the rocket, which includes Namin, who originally thought he was Sutek's chosen one, the butler Collins, Dr. Warlock, the poacher Ernie, Marcus's own brother Lawrence, and eventually attempts on the Doctor and Sarah. This comes with assistance from the robotic mummies, and together with Marcus, they go about the elimination of outside threats more gruesome methods due to them not using guns or projectiles, and not for methods such as crushing or strangulation, which gives Marcus in particular more of a carver feel to his character. To top it off, the character is given a pale white skin with dark patches around the eyes, giving a zombie-like appearance, which is intensified by Bernard Archer's cold, chilling delivery of his lines and expressionless look upon his face. Official on-screen writing credit for Pyramids of Mars was given to Stephen Harris, which is actually a pseudonym for Lewis Greifer and script editor Robert Holmes. The original idea was provided by Greifer, which involved the Egyptian mythology aspect of the narrative, but was instead set in the British Museum and involved the moon, as well as featuring Unit, in particular the Brigadier. Although initially impressed with the concept of the story, Holmes and producer Philip Hinchcliffe felt that it didn't fit in with the feel that they were trying to give to the show at the time. 
However, Lewis Greif was unavailable to do a rewrite, which left Robert Holmes to carry out the job, with him changing the location to the Priory in the early 20th century, removing the whole plot point of the moon, as well as removing unit altogether. Robert Holmes also made changes to accommodate the influences of Gothic imagery, and classic Hollywood horror films that the Hinchcliffe produced era Doctor Who became synonymous for. The most obvious influence on Pyramids and Mars is The Mummy from 1932, that featured actor Boris Karloff, as well as Hammer Films' 1959 version. Philip Hinchcliffe also suggested that the idea of the actual pyramid on Mars should be based on logic puzzles set with booby traps, which is similar to the city of the Exelons from the third Doctor story, Death to the Daleks, and the inspiration from this came from Franz Kafka's final and finished novel, The Castle. Robert Holmes also adds the theories of extraterrestrial involvement in the advances of the ancient Egyptian civilization within the narrative, in particular with the Osirian race bearing an influence on ancient gods that were worshipped. With Robert Holmes's extensive rewrites to the narrative, it becomes littered with the motifs and trademarks he traditionally laid out in his own stories, with the previously mentioned Gothic and Hollywood horror influences, but additionally the misinterpreted antagonist as a god, and the way in which redundant characters are disposed of, and Pyramids and Mars is no exception with all the guest characters except the Egyptian Ahmed in the opening scene being killed off. The novelised version of the story goes one further than this to imply that Ahmed was also killed off by worshippers of Sutek. This is something that rarely happens in Doctor Who stories, but by the casual killing off of characters once they have no further usage, merely adds to the narrative's macabre, chilling feel. Pyramids of Mars was directed by Paddy Russell, who was the first female to direct a Doctor Who story back in 1966 with The Massacre, featuring the first Doctor. Prior to Pyramids of Mars, she also directed the third Doctor story, Invasion of the Dinosaurs, in 1974. Described by those who worked with her as dictatorial and organised, this led to her conflicting with Tom Baker's approach to how he recorded the role. A prime example of this was the scene where the Doctor disguised himself as one of the robotic mummies, and Paddy Russell insisted that Tom Baker put on the costume, rather than one of the existing actors, and Baker providing the voiceover. Paddy Russell did get her own way in this story, but she later came to blows with Tom Baker on her final offering, The Horror of Fan Rock in 1977, leading to her making the decision to no longer direct Doctor Who stories. With Robert Holmes' rewritten script focusing mainly on the narrative itself and setting, this gave Paddy Russell the opportunity to work on the guest characters of the story. Through this, she was able to pick actors based on their ability to portray the characters she visualised, in particular Gabriel Wolfe as Sutek. Additionally, three of the actors had already had involvement in Doctor Who before, with Marcus Scarman actor Bernard Archard, having played Bregan in Patrick Troughton's debut story, The Power of the Daleks, Lawrence Scarman actor Michael Sheard, having appeared in the William Hartnell story, The Ark, and the John Pertwee story, The Mind of Evil, and Collins actor Michael Bilton, having appeared in Russell's directorial debut, The Massacre. For the opening shot, Paddy Russell decided to cleverly use stock footage of Egypt, in particular the pyramids and archaeological digs, which immediately sets the narrative theme of the story, whilst giving it a degree of authenticity rather than overusing the studio to recreate a site that would have cost money and would have been used only briefly. In the end, the only studio sequence that was provided for the opening scene was Marcus Scarman in the tomb itself, which was far easier to accomplish. For the actual location shots, the production team used the Manor House Stargroves in Hampshire to stand in as the Priory, which at the time belonged to Mick Jagger. The house was a rebuild from 1848, and the Gothic architecture lends itself to the feel of this era of Doctor Who. With manor houses, you tend to get a lot of surrounding land. In this case, this was utilised for scenes involved in Laura Scarman's lodge, Ernie the Poacher's hut, and the woodland, where the protagonists are pursued by the mummies. Such was the effectiveness of Stargroves. It was reused two years later in 1977's Image of the Fendal. Pyramids of Mars was broadcast as four episodes from the 25th of October to the 15th of November, as the third story of season 13, averaging in about 10.7 million viewers. Often highly regarded by both fans and critics, it won a vote in 2003 from readers of Doctor Who magazine, as the story to be released on DVD for the show's 40th anniversary.
The story falls in the midst of arguably Doctor Who's most popular era, not only in viewing figures, but generally the quality of the storylines. And yet, Pyramids and Mars to me is always one that sticks firmly in my memory when revisiting this period of Doctor Who. It is one of those stories where virtually everything is of the highest calibre. Tom Baker putting in one of his finest performances as the Doctor as perhaps his most alien, with Elizabeth Sladen playing the role of Sarah Jane Smith to perfectly combine with the Doctor. Paddy Russell's deeper involvement in the characters and clever use in actors hired is also effective, and Gabriel Wolfe's voice for Sutek sticks long in the head, and Bernard Archer's portrayal as the controlled Marcus Scarman is thoroughly chilling. Robert Holmes's ability to deconstruct and reform a script that wasn't his original concept shows his strength as the show's script editor, as well as his talents for writing itself, and it's his involvement that elevates the narrative to one of Doctor Who's strongest. The minimal use of setting and characters gives the audience focus on the narrative, which had to be strong to deliver, and in the end, it doesn't rely on any over-padding or over-the-top visuals to distract the audience from any of the story's weaknesses. I'll stop myself short of saying it's my all-time favourite Doctor Who story, but it definitely comes close. And anyone wanting to delve straight into this part of Tom Baker's tenure as the Doctor would be well suited to use this story as a starting point. Maybe your opinions differ from mine. Let me know in the comments, but for now, it's the end. But the moment has been prepared for.